So I want to welcome everybody who's tuned in so far. Um, we're here at Saluda Outfitters, our new home base here in Saluda, North Carolina. Uh, we're actually located upstairs. Um, and uh, today we're just going to give a real quick talk on, on rescue PFDs. This is going to be focused more so on the folks who have very little experience to some experience. Uh, we will go over maybe a couple more advanced concepts, but for the most part, I really want to just cover um, like the information that kind of gets people to understand whether or not they're ready for a rescue PFD or not. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. You know, feel free to chime in with comments as we kind of go along, um, especially if we're on a talking point that uh, that you know spurs a question for you. So feel free to chime in during those, those times as well. Um, I think it's kind of needless to say, um, but should uh, I'd be remiss in, uh, in not saying, uh, these classes do, or these, this kind of information does best when you take a class. Uh, we have a class coming up at the end of the month in August, our, our Common Sense Rescue, which we've now relocated to our home base river on the Green River, and we've actually extended our class time to be an extra half day, so we start on Friday now and uh, continue on on Saturday and Sunday, and conclude on Sunday evening. Uh, the big thing that I, I will say about our class as opposed to maybe some other classes is we really focus in on techniques that are commonly used more often for recreational boaters as opposed to the professional rescuer. So we've really put the onus on boat-based rescue. Um, some of the utility of the vest and how we can use it as a recreational boater. Um, so it's definitely worthwhile checking out. We've even put together a 33 page uh, rescue manual which we call our common sense rescue. Uh, so be sure to check out our rescue class if you haven't checked it out already. Uh, we've, uh, we've definitely added a lot of value to the class so it's, it's a worthwhile endeavor for sure. Um, additionally if you sign up for a class with us seven days before that class and seven days after that class you can receive a discount at Saluda Outfitters on any essential paddling gear. So if you spend less than $200, you get 10% off. Over $200, you receive 20% off, which actually is a substantial saving. So they sell anything from all of your paddling apparel, from NRS, rescue PFDs, we have Werner paddles, uh, WRSI helmets, a lot of high quality equipment. Oh, and elbow pads, Lydia's prompting me here in the background. The one thing that you don't see is that we actually have got a lot going on and here I am trying to move things around. Got a lot going on in the background as well. You know, I've got my notes back there, we've got our microphone. Show you a little behind the scenes going on though. So again, Salute Outfitters has been really a great base for us and we continue to grow our partnership and kind of create um, a great, great synergy as far as how the two kind of operate together. Um, so, with all that said, let's talk a little bit about the Rescue PFD itself. Um, rescue PFDs are what we would call a Type 5 Special Use PFD. Now, there are other types of Type 5 PFDs out there, so this is a Type 5 Special Use PFD that is specific to Whitewater. Uh, and one of the things you can do when you go to purchase a PFD is a lot of the details for the PFD are actually shared with you on the inside of the PFD itself. Uh, so it shows you that it's a Coast Guard approved, which actually goes through what's called a UL rating system, uh, which is Underwriter Laboratories, which is kind of a, a, it's a, it's an organization that tests a lot of equipment that's used for, for special purposes, anything from you know, OSHA requirements all the way to obviously like Coast Guard approved PFDs. Um, your user weight range is typically stated in here including sizing for chest size uh, and all of those are important for proper fit of a PFD. Um, again, the US Coast Guard uh, approves this for, for use in the United States and this may not seem really important. In fact, there's a lot of great PFD manufacturers worldwide uh, I've seen some really cool PFDs made from New Zealand that don't have a U.S. Coast Guard approval. Uh, and again, might not be important to you uh, until you take a trip like a Grand Canyon trip or a Middle Fork of the Salmon trip. 
where when you're actually at the put-in and they're inspecting your equipment, the expectation is, is that you have a U.S. Coast Guard approved PFD. So those kinds of things are important. Obviously, there's, with the rating system, things like that, they, they're being put through rigorous tests. We're going to save you some of the, the details of that. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll, kind of, uh, we'll, we'll link to some of that stuff in some of our show notes so you can actually see what those ratings are. But basically, they're testing tensile strength of the fabric, of you know, the webbing, of you know, the, the harness on the PFD. And uh, it's, it's quite a process and an expensive process that a lot of these companies go through to, to get the PFDs approved. Um, I think it's a worthwhile process as well. Uh, it means that there's a lot of thought that's going into it, as opposed to say like a Walmart Kamikaze PFD, where you know you can buy something off the shelf for five or ten dollars, but you're not getting those ratings. You know, it's basically a manufacturer taking advantage of the fact that they don't have to have those ratings. That a lot of places where you're where you should use a PFD are unregulated, and uh, and therefore uh, you know PFDs like that kind of fall through the cracks. So. In our particular instance, we've got a lot of special uses for a Type 5 PFD. Um, we just got a really good question. So, Olaf, you just asked if, uh, if you're from Europe and you want to paddle the Grand Canyon. Yeah, you do. You have to have a U.S. Coast Guard approved PFD. It doesn't make a difference if you're from outside of the country or not. Um, what will typically happen is if you're being outfitted with an outfitter, they'll, they'll give you one of those high float extra sport PFDs. Uh, which is Coast Guard approved, um, but you have to have a U.S. Coast Guard approved uh, vest for those particular trips. A lot of those uh, uh, agencies kind of have an interplay with one another and they know that there's a particular process that each agency kind of works through and that's why they do that. Um, so kind of back tracking to what our special use PFD does, obviously very first and foremost Essentially what it is, is it's a type 3 PFD, which is what we're commonly used to using in whitewater, which is what we would call a nearshore PFD. It's, it's not a life jacket. It, more than anything else, it's a swimming aid. Uh, and unlike some of the other PFDs, type 1s, type 2s, these PFDs aren't actually designed to roll you over onto your back if you're unconscious. The idea of this PFD is it's typically lower profile, it's designed for performance. It's designed as a swimming aid. So a Type 5 PFD starts with a Type 3 um, kind of platform and then builds up from there. Uh, I'm going to adjust our, uh, our camera here real quick and I'll take you through some of the finer points of what a Type 5 PFD actually, what it's different for. So as you can see here, if you take a look at the PFD, this looks like a normal Type 3 PFD, except there's some extra things going on on the jacket itself. And the primary difference is that you actually have a built-in rescue harness. Um, now, I have seen people take a Type 3 PFD, get an aftermarket product like this from a company, which typically will convert that company's PFD from a Type 3 to a Type 5. Those you know, upgrades, these rescue belts, are made to work with those specific PFDs. And the reason why is if you just slap this on over your PFD, this harness can actually move around. Um, that's actually problematic. So let me just go ahead and say real quick before we get into the nitty gritty of the, the harness, the purpose of the Type 5 is that it, this, this harness, this quick release belt right here, is sewn into place so it does not move. So you always know where your quick release is located. Uh, there's nothing worse than you know, being hooked into something and you want to go and release it and say that this plate right here slides under this piece of fabric. So that's kind of the danger of taking an aftermarket product like this and then just slapping it on to any old PFD. Typically you can see here like we've got a tri-glide. This tri-glide is designed to actually fit onto a very specific PFD. In this case it was a salad PFD. So be careful about buying these aftermarket products. Um, I would even go as far as saying some of those waist throws and their ability to twist around, really practice and use them. Um, so again, the idea here is that you've got a quick release harness for this utility belt that goes all the way around the PFD. Um, and if I pull this toggle here, that belt then releases 
the whole system can actually come undone and then I'm actually released from the system. Okay. So before I even get into some of the utility of say something like a tow tether, let's just talk about how this belt should be fed through properly. Um, there is the Coast Guard approved way and then there's some additional ways that you can actually use this belt that I actually use commonly uh, for different purposes. Um, so first and foremost, if we take a look at the back of the PFD here, if you look, the belt actually goes through a webbing loop right here. Okay? And if you look on this side, it's got another one on that side. Now if you look at the back of the PFD, you've got the ring that is sitting, seated between those two webbing loops. That's important. Basically those two webbing loops are rated and it prevents that ring or whatever is attached to your PFD from traveling any further than those two webbing loops. Every PFD manufacturer, Astral, Kokatat, um, pretty much all of them have this exact same webbing loop. So in this instance, the belt's not fed through, but you can see there's the webbing loop there. And here the webbing loop is where the belt's fed through, and you can see it's through the webbing loop there. And the one thing I don't like about the Astral is it hides it so you can't actually see if it's fed properly. Um, I will say we work with NRS, so we're a little bit biased when it comes to it, but the big thing is, is when you're actually working in these instances, you want everything to be as clear as humanly possible. It's easy to make mistakes under stress. So when this is fed properly, take a look. So now you can see it's through both of those loops and then fed through. So I can see that I'm fed through properly on both sides. I'm actually going to take it under where it's supposed to be. And every manufacturer is a little bit different. It comes, you know, a, a manufacturer's PFD generally comes with instructions on how it should be fed properly. So in this instance, it comes through. Webbing is nice and flat. There's no kinks in it. And then from there, I come to the metal tri-glide. Now this is where, you know, you can have some difference in how the belt is actually fed. Coast Guard approval, up through the back hole first, the back of the plate, down through the front of the plate, and it should look like so initially. Crank that puppy down, nice and tight, bring the Fastex buckle over, and then through that Fastex buckle, and cinch it down. Now notice I don't have a lot of extra webbing here either. This is actually the only part of my PFD that I've actually maybe have cut straps down. I'll talk about why I don't cut down other straps on this PFD. But for this one, if you look at, you know, right off the shelf, a lot of the time they give you an excess of webbing. Like that would be way too long. And the, the, why, the reason why that's problematic is if this belt starts to hang down, under its own weight, that's gonna kink. And if you go to release that under tension, that kink can actually bind and jam. So one of the things that we're looking to do is we're looking to shorten the belt. One thing that I suggest people to do is put on all of your winter paddling gear, basically all the gear that you think you would wear, then cut, then melt. And when you melt, you wanna make sure that the melted edges are nice and flat. You're not leaving any large bubbles you know, that webbing is nice and flat where it's melted. Uh, that way, again, it doesn't get caught in the Fastex buckle or that plate. Uh, a point of maintenance and an area that should be checked out pretty commonly is the actual toggle itself. If you, commonly what happens is UV starts to break down this, uh, this cord here, it starts to fray. Additionally, the toggle itself has a knot kind of on the underside here. You want to make sure that knot is nice and good. I would say that the tail end on this is a little bit too short for my liking, so I'm actually, after this today, I'm gonna to untie this and retie it. The idea is that the tail is twice the length of your knot to ensure that it doesn't walk back through. But you want to check this from time to time. I've actually seen these toggles fail, and then somebody has to figure out while they're actually on a live bait or something like that, how to find a way to get their plate undone, in which you can. You can actually pop, slide your thumbs underneath, 
and then pop that whole system out of place. Oh, good question, Sam. You asked, why is the webbing cut at an angle? And uh, that's a good question. I actually, I don't have the answer for that offhand. Uh, I've always been in the practice of cutting it at an angle. That's an answer that I should have. And you know what? I'm gonna follow up in show notes and make sure that I do have that answer. Uh, I would say that primarily it's a, it's a feeding um, reason for feeding it through, but I know that's not gonna be the correct answer there. That's a good question and uh, you stumped me this morning. So, good on you, I can be stumped, I'm human. Um, anybody else wanna chime in on that, feel free to, uh, but like I said, in the show notes, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to, to follow up with that as well. Um, so, let's talk, again, let's talk about some of the things that uh, make the Rescue PFD kind of awesome too, and that's um, some of its utility function. Uh, some of the things that I will say with a rescue PFD, you know, you might be carrying additional equipment along, so having pocket space so you can actually carry these things, I think is extremely important. Um, and one thing that I'll get back to real quick uh, is some of the other ways that you can actually feed the belt, especially when we get to the tether. I showed you guys how to feed it based on the Coast Guard approval and what the UL rating for that rescue harness is, which is about 730 pounds. Um, so, some of the things that I think about again is pocket space, things that I carry on me, not in my boat, things like my pin kit, I've got my knife and my whistle actually on a tether, I prefer a folding knife in my pocket, sunscreen's important of course, you know, candy wrappers, I carry two prussics in the front pocket here, additionally, I'll take you back down again a little bit, additionally, Kind of, I have a back pocket here. I carry, this is about 12 feet tied off, so it's actually a pretty short sling, but in most cases, this sling is gonna be enough for a quick one. I do carry additional webbing if I'm in an area where I think big anchors are gonna be necessary. I keep a locking carabiner on this sling almost all the time, that way it can be a quick and dirty tow harness if I really wanted to, throwing the sling over my shoulder on the downstream side. Uh, so, great utility, lives in a pocket right there, always accessible. I'll keep another locking carabiner. I keep a couple pulleys. And the general rule of thumb for a pin kit is that you're carrying, for a lightweight pin kit, in my instance, I carry three locking carabiners, two pulleys, two prosics, and one webbing loop. Um, you might be asking, you saw only two carabiners there in my pocket. Well, my tow tether actually has a locking carabiner as well. I like things that kind of double up. Now, I have been in instances where having additional carabiners can be beneficial, but, you know, in a group, it's kind of the expectation that people should have at least this minimum. And as you combine that gear, your equipment list kind of grows. Uh, so that stuff lives with me in my PFD. That's my lightweight pin kit. In most instances, actually in all instances, I can set up a basic Z-drag or a three to one mechanical advantage. Now going back to the PFD itself and how it's fed and the tow tether itself, one of the things I wanna show you here, things that I consider before I ever use a tow tether is how fast can I get out of this tow tether system? I have found myself in a situation where I've had to release my harness while upside down while using a tow tether. Um, it sucks. I actually got out of the practice of using a tow tether um, for this exact purpose. Uh, I just took an advanced with water rescue instructor course this past spring. And I've gotten back in the habit of keeping the tether on because there's so much utility to the tether and you can't use it if you don't have it. Um, I'm not towing boats with it primarily though. More often than not, it's to maintain my own equipment or it's to, to clip into a rope very quickly, and I'll show you some of those things that you can do uh, with that tow tether briefly. Uh, one thing that I will do though, especially if I'm towing something and I really wanna release fast, I don't need all that friction through the plate and the fast X buckle, so especially if it's something that I'm towing that and you know, it's just gear, and you know, I'm more important than that gear, I might just go through the fast X buckle, and that alone might be enough friction for me to actually you know, tow a boat across. But if I pop that, that comes out a lot faster and a lot easier. 
more often what I do is I do go through the triglide at least once and I'm using the front of the buckle there. I go through, I cinch down, and then through the fast X buckle. So, Deb, thank you. You buy the easier feeding. I, I'm sure there's a purpose, Sam, and uh, I'm still stumped, and I'm still thinking about it. Uh, we'll definitely, we'll be touching base on that. Um, so, cool things about toe tethers. And again, this is something that you want to get into the practice of doing. So let's say I needed to hop out of my boat real quick. I have my toe tether. What I do is I actually like to stash it in my pocket here. It's not actually attached to anything. We'll talk about the importance of not attaching to hard points here in a moment. But I can pull my tether out real quick. I can clip in to my own boat. Now I can step out on land. Um, it's a great way not to lose your boat if you're trying to help somebody drain a boat. Um, really great. Uh, the boat is free of water, so I'm not being dragged. Again, I'm thinking really hard before I clip into something. A toe tether, depending on its length, again, I could use probably the sling even as a toe tether, but I could wrap this around a tree real quick, and now I've got essentially a quick makeshift anchor to kind of anchor myself down if I'm throwing a throw rope by myself or something along those lines. Uh, additionally, I can become a, what we like to call the human throw bag. Uh, if I have someone actually manning the line, of a throw rope, I can clip into a rope real quick. They can hold on to the other end. Now I'm on a live bait rescue. So again, the tow tether's got a lot of utility to it, a lot of quick utility to it. I think what it more commonly has been used as, uh, and probably problematically so, is just clipping into a boat full of water. And we just recently put out a video on how to give a boat a quick little drain um, so as to lighten the boat and then clip into a boat. Um, very rarely, very, very rarely will you ever see me clip into a boat full of water. And in most instances, it's probably gonna be in more of a big water situation where I'm not worried about snags or entrapments. Um, the big thing here is like, I don't like the excess hanging out. Uh, I don't like using this in areas where there's lots of snagging hazards or where I can go around a rock or something along those lines had the experience of having to tow a boat back across to a swimmer before on a really big water run and we even went as far as making sure the boat was completely drained of water putting a spray skirt over the cockpit so there was no chance of water getting in and then actually towing it across because it was a fairly continuous run so traditionally though tow tethers are designed to be clipped into the pfd every manufacturer has their own but the kind of the the standard uh, in the community is this quick release lash tab here. Um, very similar to the, the fast X buckle, but much smaller. So the idea is that you actually clip that carabiner in. It's a locking carabiner too, so it's not gonna accidentally get clipped into anything else. I'm using a magnetic magnetron, uh, black diamond magnetron uh, um, carabiner, which I've been very, very happy with. Um, the idea here is if I needed to pull it off real fast, it comes off. And you saw I actually struggled with that a little bit. Um, it can be a bit finicky, uh, but the idea is that under pressure, this thing will release. Now one thing I have found with this quick release tab, if I can refeed it here, is that it works great when you're pulling it off straight. It doesn't work all that well when you start to pull it off at an angle. You can see I'm having a tough time now. Now if I pull it straight, it comes right off. So again, that's some familiarity with the equipment, understanding how your equipment works, the limitations of your equipment. This is imperfect. Physics is gonna, you know, it's gonna, it, it's gonna surprise you from time to time. And as complete and well thought out as these PFDs are, they're not, infallible you know it's only as good as the user's knowledge of the pfd itself so what i've gotten in the habit of doing is i actually enjoy i've got again this pocket right here the space and i've got kind of this stretchy pocket where my pin kit lives so what i end up doing is i actually take my belt all the way through kind of stuff that down and that locks it in place so it doesn't pull and notice it sits nice and low profile i don't get that big loop 
and then I bring it back through and kind of just tuck it out of the way. I have yet to have this thing deploy on me. Uh, you know, I think this is, this is fairly snug, especially when I put all of this equipment in there. But I keep that carabiner where I can just kind of pull it out with one finger and it's ready to go and I can clip into whatever I need to clip into. Um, so that's some thoughts there. Now, one last thing I'll mention about the tow tether is not connecting it to a hard point on the PFD. Uh, and we'll talk about one of the limitations of the Astral PFD here in a moment, um, where there's actually kind of a hidden hard point a lot of the time that a lot of folks don't know about. But the big thing is here, see it's attached to my belt. I see a lot of the time, got some music, we got a live band in here. Um, I see a lot of the time people clipping in their, their toe tethers into their shoulder straps here. Now the problem with this is if I go to release this, let's say it comes out of the belt, I'm still attached. So I'm attached to a hard point now. So even if I released from the harness, I'm now attached and I'm still stuck. So it's really important to remember that your tether never gets attached to a hard point. You're either using this quick release tab, you're using um, you know, a pocket that's free and clear uh, that also allows that thing to pull free. It doesn't entrap on itself or snag on itself. Uh, I think that's super important. Now, and this brings up a good point. Again, the Astral PFD is a great jacket, but I do want to bring up one of its limitations here. So I'm going to take this one off real quick. We, we bring this up in rescue classes a lot because uh, this is a super popular jacket. So a lot of the time what happens is Give me just a moment. And this is going to be kind of ugly here because I'm doing this kind of fast. So what folks do is they feed, you know, the harness through or the, the belt through. And then they tuck this uh, carabiner and, you know, they sell a web tow as well into this pocket here. This pocket's awesome. Like you can store all sorts of stuff. There's pockets on both sides. Some people don't like the position. Some people do. You know, it's all preference. It's all. It all comes down to what you want. Um, and this is a youth size here. So there we go. We can kind of see. So the thing about this now, if I zip up this pocket, some of you might actually see where this is going. This zipper is so strong that we've actually had people hang after releasing off of this zipper and that carabiner still doesn't release. So that argu arguably can be considered a hard point on your PFD. And uh, you know you should really consider um, using the lash tab that they put on the front of the PFD as opposed to that side pocket. I don't even know if Astral initially designed this to be the pocket for the web toe. It's just what people started to end up using. I, I know when I use the 300R, um, that's the pocket I used for my web toe. Um, but you notice they still put that lash tab there for your, uh, for your toe tether. Be aware, that's what that's there for. Cool. So we had a good question earlier this morning before we got started. When do you retire a rescue PFP? Um, well, if you're teaching as often as we are and out on the water as often as we are, you retire a PFD about once a year. That's not a joke, like we probably extend it into another season, um, but we certainly, we give it enough UV damage and enough wear and tear that we actually go through these PFDs about once, once every year. And the big thing that you're looking for, you know, with, uh, with wear points and everything else, you start seeing flattening of webbing and you can actually see that, that glossiness in the webbing from, from heat and rubbing and all that stuff. And again, this isn't really at a point where it's problematic, but you know, you give this another season like that and I would say, I would argue um, that uh, you know, that would start to be a point of contention. Um, you know, additionally, this, uh, this yellow used to be a nice gold color. So you're actually starting to see some UV fading. Now granted, some fading is going to be normal, but as that UV degradation actually starts to set in into the foam and everything else, you actually lose 
uh, buoyancy in the PFD. So one of the things I'll recommend to folks is when you first buy your PFD, go out and float in it, swim in it. Like, don't forget, swimming is also a skill that needs to be practiced. So go out and float in it, see how that PFD floats you, see how you like swimming with it, and then continue to do that. Like, we have the advantage of going out and teaching these rescue classes, so we know how our PFDs are going, uh, doing for us. Um, I notice if my head is sitting a lot lower in the water. So as that starts to happen, I have a certain threshold for how high I like my head on the water, especially in a high stress situation. So that's another area that you're gonna be considering. Um, I would say mildew is a big point. Um, you know, a lot of the time, for us anyways, I don't think my PFD ever dries. Um, you know, I, I joke that I live my life in varying stages of dampness, but it's true, like most of my gear just doesn't have the opportunity to dry this time of year. So mildew starts to set in, you know, you get that really strong musty smell or something along those lines, then yes, you should probably be thinking about retiring. That gets really expensive, but you know, you're talking about 200 days a year that we're using these PFDs. So, you know, you're spending $200 on a rescue PFD, that's a dollar a day for your safety. It's really cheap if you think about it. And I'd go as far as saying, buying rescue PFD secondhand is a bad idea. You don't know the history of the PFD. You don't know how much time it's spent in the sun. You might be tempted to do it because it's a lot cheaper, but I see a lot of people selling used rescue PFDs for like $150. Like you don't know the history of that, and I'm not trying to squash someone's dreams about selling off used gear, but a helmet and a rescue PFD are your two lifelines. You have to, you have to ask yourself the hard question, how much do you value your safety? So. Lydia and myself, we retire our PFD about once a year. Um, there's still plenty of use in them. That's 200 days. Um, I would say you know, you're probably getting 400 good days out of a PFD. There's no doubt. There's no perfect science there either. Like you go somewhere where you just get far more sun, you know, or you know, it, it, there's so many intangibles. Um, not intangibles, but there's so many variables that, uh, that contribute to the degradation of a PFD. Um, other areas that you want to be looking for, obviously your shoulder straps, the webbing on your shoulder straps, look, those attachment points, there's no fraying, nothing along those lines. Um, this PFD is still in really good shape right now, and uh, I've been using this one since, I think, March is when we got our, our new PFDs, and we'll, we'll update ours again probably in March. Um, I'm trying to think right now if there's anything else that I would like to go over. Um, do you have... Questions. Cool. Um, Don asked what skill level of proficiency you at before investing in a rescue vest? So, great question, common question is at what point do you invest in a rescue PFD? Um, you know, a rescue PFD is only as good as the knowledge that you have in order to use it. Uh, I mean, very obviously, we went over some basic things today. There's a lot of things we didn't go over, too. That's why I'm saying, like, a class is uber uber important because the, we go into the, the, the painful details in a way um, and you get practice, hands on practice, nothing substitutes that. Uh, so I would say you know, it'd be prudent to buy one after a rescue class uh, but realize too if you've got a rescue PFD on you're telling people something, you're saying I know something. How willing are you to actually be an active part of a rescue uh, in different places? Uh, that said, there's some utility to it as well if you're being rescued. Um, but I would say it's only as useful as the knowledge that you have uh, to use it. So, you know, this video, there's other videos out there. You could probably teach yourself to use a rescue PFD, there's no doubt. There's a lot of things you can teach yourself in whitewater kayaking. And, you know, I'm a big advocate of getting out and practicing outside of the scope of instruction. If you don't, you're not gonna improve. Instruction is only gonna introduce knowledge. You've gotta go out and practice that knowledge. So, you know, the investment of a rescue PFD over, say, a good type three PFD, you know, in some instances, it's only an additional 50 bucks, but you need to know how to feed that rescue harness properly. You need to know how to release that rescue harness properly. And if you know somebody who knows how to use one properly, they can teach you that probably in about 10 minutes, and then you just leave the function alone such as toe tethers, such as live bait, such as those kinds of things that you know, really offer a lot of utility for the rescue PFD alone until you've actually taken a class. This is one of those classes, or one of those th things that I do recommend a class for no matter what. You should take a rescue class.
Great question. Oh, so, nice. when, when, at what skill level should you be taking a rescue class and or buying a rescue PFD? Um, I think it's not so much related as much to skill level as much as to your leadership level. So, for example, if you're out on class two, three, and you're working with a group that it's kind of inherent that they're kind of taking the lead that they've got this equipment, that they're trained in this equipment, in their teaching or mentoring, then, you know, in those instances, you know, it may not uh, be beneficial for you to have one. Um, it might be able to show you a thing or two if you do, uh, and you can gain benefit from that. But if you're going out on your own, I don't care if you're going and paddling class five uh, or class two, if you're going out on your own, you're leading your own trips, that's where rescue knowledge or the what if Kind of scenarios should be focused in on so you know independence um, in a lot of ways is going to breed some necessity uh, in skills and you know I, I keep saying rescue like everybody gets these notions of grandeur of like some uh, extravagant rescue rescue is just you know it's part it's normal everyday stuff there's self rescue and then there's group rescue and um, you know the the rescue PFD is there as kind of a luxury in some ways. Uh, it definitely makes some things easier. Do you need it? No, you don't need it. Um, can you get by without it? Certainly you can. Uh, but it, it's definitely, it makes things faster, it makes things more convenient, um, but it can also complicate things if used improperly. Were there any other questions? Yeah, um, even asked about the threading of the triglide, which you went over a little bit. Can you just be specific in when why you might not want to go through the entire triglide. So again, when you're feeding that triglide, um, you might be asking yourself, what am I using the harness for, or that, you know, the rescue belt for? Um, you know, am I just towing equipment? Or am I towing an unconscious paddler? Um, in a lot of instances, or, you know, the amount of force that you're going to be putting on the PFD as well. You know, a, a V-lower where you're lowering a person down in current you certainly be, can be putting a great deal of force onto uh, the person that's actually hooked in. Uh, in those instances, I would, I would feed the, the tri-glide as recommended by the U.S. Coast Guard. Or, you know, think about it in terms of how futile of a situation is. Am I being lowered down over something that's extremely dangerous? Uh, am I using it as a lifeline? Um, that's where those kinds of um, applications are, are certainly um, calling for feeding the entire triglide. For simple towing, most of the stuff that I do when I'm teaching, um, you know, if I'm not really, uh, you know, if, it, if we're only talking about equipment, um, or even just an unconscious boater, um, you know, we, we teach people how to do unconscious swimmer toes, things like that. That's not gonna put that much force on you. Um, you know, feeding it through once and then through the fast X buckle seems to be enough for me. Um, and again, that's going to come down to you practicing, you seeing how much it takes to actually release. You'll be surprised, like, it takes a great deal of force, even with just feeding it through once, to get that, that damn belt through the buckle. Um, so you have to practice, you have to see. Um, but those would be my applications of feeding it uh, through the buckle. Evan, you just asked the question, do you change the way you thread the buckle through your day? You certainly can, and you know, it's, it's simple. Like, it really is, like, once you get used to using, like, this is my work uniform, right? So, I've gotten so used to making sure everything's working right. I'm sure in some ways, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw a comparison that's totally unfair and untrue. It's like an airline pilot getting ready to fly in a way. You know, I'm making sure all of my equipment is ready for the day. Um, but uh, just to show you how fast, and I, I am pretty quick with getting dressed every day. So that buckle or that that uh, webbing right there is hanging down. It's through. I'm going through once, and there we go. So now I'm fed for most of my applications. Now, if I was going live bait, that's assuming something, you know, much more escalated is happening. I can pop this real quick. All it takes. And granted, this is happening right now while I'm not under duress. Now, I fed it 
as a lifeline. And again, nothing's kinked. I'm making sure at the beginning of the day, everything's fed properly. So all of my work is being done right here where it's visual. Um, I'm obviously being checked out by a buddy, you know, as redundancy, uh, but I certainly have changed how I feed the belt throughout the day. Um, again, if I'm on class one, two, where there's not a lot of force, it's only going through the fast X buckle. That's it. Like for most applications, that's all I'm going to need. That's a great question as well. Lou, do we have any other questions? Well, cool, uh, guys. I'll do a little bit of uh, you know our outro here. But if you have any other questions, feel free to chime in real quick. Um, you know, let me just go ahead and say this real fast again. This is not a replacement for a class, obviously. You know, what we wanted to do is give a little bit of knowledge. To, a common question we get with a lot of students is, should I get a rescue PFD? When do I get a rescue PFD? How do I use a rescue PFD? Um, more so, if anything else, I want to show you some of the functions that we've used um, as maybe a selling point to get the knowledge to use one. Um, it's, again, not a replacement for practice. Uh, when I took my very first rescue class back in 2005, my instructor uh, emphasized that these skills, the rescue skills, should be practiced quarterly. I would argue that they should be practiced even more than that, especially, um, I would say most people probably don't practice it nearly enough. But, you know, you get done with the river trip, you're pulling your throw rope out of your, out of your uh, boat, give that throw rope a, a couple tosses, you know, do a coiled throw. Um, Big thing is, is you might not need a lot of these skills, but when you need them, you really, really need them. So practice is, uh, is definitely prudent. Um, aside from that, we do have a class at the end of the month. I think those dates are the, 20, the 20, 25th through the 27th, I think is what it is. Friday evening, we start here in the classroom. And uh, hello. Um, Friday evening, we stop in the class, uh, start in the classroom, a little chalk talk. We'll cover some knots, even though we we ask you guys to cover that stuff, um, you know, on the front end. Uh, but we do get into some of the physics, which kind of gets a little gray when we're out in the field and we're trying to do more. Uh, but the other two days is purely on water. Uh, yes, we'll do a little bit of chalk talk each day, but more so those days, it's about being in action and actually using the skills. And it's not just us showing you; you're going to be doing it. Um, like I said, we put a huge emphasis on boat-based rescue, which is what you're going to be most commonly using when you go on your river trips, learning to get people and gear to shore, um, not to mention improving your own self-rescue skills such as swimming. Uh, so again, that's the 25th through the 27th of August. We'd love to have you guys join. Um, you'll also learn some more uses of the rescue PFD itself. Additionally, uh, we'd like to thank Saluda Outfitters. You know, it's our, our new home here in Saluda. Um, we're growing, we're learning a lot uh, about what to carry in the store for, you know, our guests and their customers. Uh, and we're starting to really kind of refine things. But if there's things that you would like to see here, give us a shout. We're, we're super, you know, we're, we're super responsive to it right now. Um, I would say, you know, folks have come in and asked for something and it's not even a week later and, and now we have it in stock. Um, but know that if you sign up for a class, you get a discount seven days before, seven days after, 10% for less than 200, 20% for over 200, which is a great deal. Uh, and there's rescue PFDs, type three PFDs, throw ropes. Uh, some of the things that we don't have in stock right now, but we will uh, before the rescue class, will be some of the hardware that you would need for the rescue class. Um, all said, our rescue classes, if you don't have the hardware, you don't have the equipment, we provide it for you. Uh, so all said, really happy to, uh, to provide this, uh, this service for you guys. We really like this Facebook Live medium. Um, we'll post this to our YouTube page later for reference. And uh, anything that you guys would like to see in the future, any topics that you would like us to talk about, we can do this on the water as well. We can pre-record, we can do a lot of different things. Um, you know, drop us a line, let us know, info at h2odreams.com. And be sure to check out our website, h2odreams.com. All said, have a great day. We'll see you out on the river.